today we will be discussing brain bleeds. These are hemorrhages or bleeding that occur within the cranium that affect the brain in some way. There are lots of different types of brain bleeds, but we're going to discuss three of them. First, we have epidural hemorrhages. Epi means outside, and dura refers to this thick covering that surrounds the brain. The dura is part of the meninges, and the meninges has three layers, the dura, arachnoid, and pia mater, all of which surround and protect the brain. Now, in an epidural bleed, again, we have bleeding outside of this dura. And outside of the dura, we have a lot of arteries. So an epidural bleed is an arterial bleed. That means it's high pressure, high flow, and very dangerous. How does a person get an epidural hemorrhage? Well, it's usually caused by a blood force trauma to the head. So an injury or a blow to the head, usually at the temporal side of the skull, that leads to bleeding and damage of the middle meningeal artery. The middle meningeal artery will then begin to bleed, and this will rapidly expand and grow as a hematoma. Now this is really dangerous because arteries are such high pressure. This bleeding will expand, the brain will get compressed, and you're really worried about neurological function. When this happens to someone, symptoms can generally range in a three-phase cycle. Classically, the person will get hit on the head and start having major neurological deficits and even loss of consciousness. Over time, they will improve and have this classic lucid interval where everything's fine and they feel a lot better. But the telltale sign of an epidural hemorrhage is after this lucid interval, they get worse again. So this bad, good, bad sequence of symptoms is really associated with epidural hemorrhages. Now on imaging of a person with an epidural hemorrhage, we're usually first going to get a non-contrast CT scan of the brain to check for any bleeding at all. This is usually done with anyone that has some sort of blood trauma to the head. Now on non-contrast CTs, you're gonna see bright white whenever there's bleeding. In an epidural hemorrhage, you're specifically going to see bright white in the shape of a lens. Why a lens? Well, this dura that is surrounding the bleed is actually going to compress the edges of it, creating this lens shape. Here's an image of a classic epidural hemorrhage. And when you see this, this is an emergency. You're calling for a surgical consult, and you want a neurosurgeon to evacuate this bleed immediately. Epidural hemorrhages are super dangerous. Next, we've got subdural hemorrhages. Even though they sound similar, they're actually really different. Sub means below, and again, dura is that covering around the brain. Subdural hemorrhages are usually made up of venous blood, because below the dura, we usually have a lot of veins and sinuses, which are filled with venous blood. These are really low pressure systems. Blood in the veins move really slowly. That means bleeding in this area is really not going to cause that rapid expansion that we see with epidural hematomas. Subdural hematomas are also caused by a variety of different causes. They could be caused by blood force trauma or a fall where you hit your head, but they could also be caused by spontaneous bleeding that happens in the elderly. They could also happen with people that are taking anticoagulants. These are blood thinners that just make a person more likely to bleed. Now with subdural hemorrhages, since they are so slow forming, the symptoms look a little different. When the person immediately has the bleeding, they might have neurological deficits. This may lead to loss of consciousness, or it might not. And over time, we classically see these people get better. So that means we usually don't intervene with subdural hemorrhages with surgical intervention right away. We're actually going to wait and watch this person over some time. If they continue to improve, the subdural hemorrhage could actually resolve itself. However, if they deteriorate, surgical intervention might be necessary to take up this bleed. On imaging for a person with a subdural hemorrhage, we're going to see a much different shape. We're still gonna see that bright white because this is still blood. However, the shape of the bleeding is gonna follow a crescent shape. Rather than being pinched on the edges like in an epidural bleed, subdural bleeds kind of taper off at the ends as they continue around the dura. Remember, they're not being compressed by anything. So subdural hemorrhages have this different shape and they can cross suture lines. So sutures are these borders where the different pieces of our skull when we're born actually fuse to create one skull. Now, subdural bleeds can actually cross the suture lines without any problem because they're below the dura. However, epidural bleeds are going to be contained within suture lines because they're above or outside the dura. Finally, we have subarachnoid hemorrhages. Now, these are unique from the other ones because they're usually not associated with blood force trauma, even though they technically could be. So, subarachnoid hemorrhages occur below the arachnoid matter. Subarachnoid hemorrhages are usually arterial blood. So, again, this is an emergency. This is arterial bleeding, usually caused by an aneurysm that has ruptured, and this is the telltale sign. Because we have an arterial bleed from a ruptured aneurysm, subarachnoid hemorrhages require immediate surgical intervention. They are also an emergency. Now, how do we know that someone's having a subarachnoid hemorrhage? 
Well, first of all, the symptom is a classic thunderclap headache. This is when a person's headache goes from zero to 10 out of 10 pain in less than 30 minutes. It is classically the worst headache of their life. It's not like a migraine, it's not like a tension headache, it is unique. So when we hear that history, worst headache of my life, we are concerned for subarachnoid hemorrhage. On a CT scan, again, we're gonna see bright white because of the bleeding, but usually the bleeding is going to follow the sulci and gyrite of the brain because the bleeding is located in the subarachnoid space. The shape is very different, again, than subdural and epidural bleeds. Subarachnoid hemorrhages, like I mentioned, are emergencies and they require surgical intervention immediately. These bleeds could be caused by trauma that might have caused the aneurysm to burst, but they're usually more associated with hypotensive crises. A person gets a bleed in their brain because their blood pressure has increased dramatically, or they have an aneurysm and that high blood pressure just weakens the walls of the artery and makes that little balloon burst with blood. So these are three different types of bleeds, epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. We've learned about how they occur, the symptoms associated with them, what we see on imaging, and what we might do. If you want to learn anything else, drop it down in the comments. We're also happy to answer any questions you might have. My name is Alyssa and this is Medicine.